Welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Farm Scale Permaculture, Techniques, Practices, and Philosophies for Permanent Agriculture Systems. I'm Jesse Schmidt, and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project. I'll be moderating this session. Our presenter today is Keith Morris. Since 2000, he has worked professionally as a designer, builder, and grower of ecologically regenerative, socially just, and culturally appropriate whole systems in cities and countrysides around the world. He teaches at the University of Vermont, the Yestermorrow Design Build School, Sterling College, Paul Smith's College, Burlington Permaculture, and has worked for USAID Farmer to Farmer in Nigeria and Ghana. Welcome, Keith. Uh, thanks, Jesse. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just uh, as far as sound goes, is that sounding okay to folks? If you could maybe thumb up or let me know that that sounds good. I think it sounds pretty good. If you might be able to pull your mic a little bit away. Um, it's just a little muffled. Yeah. Okay. I can pull it away. Great. Um, great. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to be a part of the webinar series. It's such a great collection of resources already there in terms of webinars. Um, yeah, so um, this was... Um, uh, some stuff that we already did here as far as the map, so I think I'm just going to skip through that. And as Jesse said, um, you know, I, I work as a designer. Um, really, my work as a designer began um, working for a variety of farms. Um, I started my own farm when I was 23 in an interesting rent-to-own process. It's Willow Crossing Farm um, in Johnson, Vermont, where we grow um, fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes, vines, medicinal herbs, and we're increasingly doing added value in terms of um, farm. Oh, um, I'm hearing that I'm not. I could turn my mic up. How's that, Ida? Does that sound a little better? Um, <clears throat> just let me know if there's sound issues again. So. Um, increasingly, we're doing kind of added value production in terms of farm dinners and educational events. Um, my other business is um, Prospect Rock Permaculture, which is really more of a design and education aspect where I work with farmers and other institutions and community groups to um, help figure out how to make landscapes more productive and connected. Um, just a brief little history with that. If anyone's familiar with these two areas geographically, um, we, Willow Crossing is an area that is overlooked by Prospect Rock. And um, long before there was such great aerial photography that we have today, I would go up to Prospect Rock, a bluff on the Long Trail, and kind of look down over my farm in order to help me uh, figure things out and do some design work. So. Um, we're going to be talking about permaculture design as applied to farms, um, but this isn't intended as a basic introduction to permaculture, so um, it's a very, very big field. There's a lot of things to explore, um, but for those of you that aren't familiar, the, the word comes not only from permanent agriculture, but also permanent culture, and kind of looking at how ecology can better inform the ways that we meet our needs. So everything from food really as a centerpiece, you know, um, agriculture has always been a centerpiece of permaculture, but also shelter, also energy, also waste management, um, how these things can be better connected and modeled after what we see working in natural systems. So I have two definitions here. Of permaculture, there are hundreds, um, but meeting human needs while increasing ecological health and um, the postmodern synthesis of all wise human behavior, a big part of permaculture, of course, is studying traditional techniques and recombining them in, in novel ways in, in response to some of the things that we're facing in the 20th century. So, um, most, mostly, um, permaculture is a vision and a design system, and it's a network of people. That's really where um, 
it's, it's an exciting thing to be a part of. There's folks all over the world um, using this design technique um, in order to actualize this, this vision of a permanent culture. Um, its basis is in ethics, which is something that's kind of unique in land management systems. Um, and in slogan form, these are earth care, people care, and fair share, um, which are kind of self-evident, but obviously we want to look, take responsibility for the resources that we depend on, natural systems that we depend on, but we're also caring for people, um, and, and it's really um, about how, as I've said, we're meeting human needs while, while improving ecological health and recognizing that that isn't necessarily a contradiction of terms, although there's certainly plenty of evidence to, to lead us to believe that may be the case um, when we look at long-term human needs. Obviously, we need to have good soil in which we grow our food. We need to have clean air. We need to have clean water. Um, and then lastly, and not least importantly, um, fair share, meaning limits to consumption, limits to population, but most importantly, redistribution of our resources towards better care of the earth and better care of people. Um, so um, that's the permaculture ethics in a nutshell. If you aren't familiar with permaculture, or even if you are, um, I just point out here at the bottom the permacultureprinciples.com website, which is really a great uh, resource as a, as a basic introduction to permaculture ethics and principles. Um, the design principles are varied, and they're the things that we are learning from our study of traditional culture and our study of ecology and what's working in any context. And while we'll look at some techniques that may be place specific or specific to a culture or e ecological context, really at its core, these ethics and principles will work wherever we find ourselves in the world. Um, so I won't be getting too into depth with these principles, but we'll address them a little bit. Um, are folks seeing my pointer as I move it around the screen? Um, yeah, so we'll be looking at how we can integrate pieces of our systems to be more mutually beneficial. Um, just to kind of give a sense of this spectrum of permaculture design, I'll share with you the permaculture flower. And we see there's these kind of seven points of action. Um, permaculture really encompasses how we build, the tools and technologies we use, the education and our cultural aspects, um, health and well-being, finances and economy, land tenure and community governments, and land and nature stewardship. So it's, it's a very big uh, system. And you know today, we're really going to be looking at just some of these, um, maybe specifically how we read landscapes and um, you know how agriculture fits in in terms of our land and nature stewardship. Um, but all of these different pieces are kind of part of our permaculture toolkit. Um, all right. So at any time, if there's questions, feel free to type them into the box there. Um, I'm going to share a little bit more about my own farm. Just briefly, we're actually going to uh, do some time travel. This is an aerial photograph that was taken in 1942 of the area where I farm. And in 1942, they started taking aerial photographs um, as a part of uh, defense strategies for World War II. And they've turned out to be some really great resources for our understanding of land management. And um, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I just kind of point out the curve of the river here as it was in 1942, and also introduce these photographs not only to share my own farm, but to let you know that if you're farming, um, you probably it's probably going to be well worth your while to dig into the archives of the map rooms of the USDA or your local uh, state land grant university or wherever these files may be archived because they will share 
incredible insight to the past of our landscapes. So um, as we travel through time here, we're going to see a couple of things. Um, one is that even in just a few decades, um, we see tremendous changes happening in our landscapes. And I'm sure we're all well aware of that, but to really be able to quantify that in a place-specific way can be an incredibly helpful tool in helping contextualize our own decision-making process and our designs. So in terms of this particular site, we see that obviously there's some pretty severe erosion happening along a riverbank. Um, also here, as we move um, into 1995, we see the original farm and homestead and barn raised and put into the ground where there's the beginnings of a, of a, of a church um, constructed. And we can see, as I've started to set up my farm, some of the changes happening in terms of ecological secession, both allowing some areas of old pasture to, to start to regrow. And, you know, here we are with one of the more recent photograph series where you can kind of get a sense of um, what's happening on my farm, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, um, I share that because it's really critical that we make an effort to, to comprehend our place in our landscapes with long-term perspective and, and do that in order to have long-term cooperation with the ecosystems that we're cooperating, that we're, you know, depending on and interacting with, and most importantly, use that long-term understanding as a, as a point of foresight so we can do some long-term planning, because that's, um, that's where we're going to be heading here now, is um, getting into some of the details of, of how we'll do um, the actual work of design. Um, so, the permaculture design process, it can be done in an endless variety of ways, but in its simplest, you know, we want to be very clear about what it is that we're trying to achieve in terms of goals articulation. Um, let's see. Okay. And um, we'll be working on maps in terms of having an actual physical record that we can refer to as we make observations about our landscapes. Um, the focus of today's talk is really going to be how we do site analysis. And from that analysis, we're going to come up with design concepts, which are really very kind of loose ideas. And I know that's hard for many of us, especially for market growers. And I, I actually, I'll, I'll take a minute just to ask um, who is farming and if Folks wouldn't mind just typing in to the chat box there um, if you're farming, if you're coming here with a specific uh, site in mind in terms of where you want to apply this design process. Um, I'd be curious to see that. Um, okay, great. Yeah. Um, so we as growers are often really good at thinking about specific crops or varieties and we may have some great skills in terms of rotations and soil prep. Um, and these are all critical, you know, foundational, but um, permaculture is kind of going to flip this around a little bit and that we're not going to be starting necessarily from an individual crop or technique, but really contextualizing that in the whole of our farm. And, this is why having a design concept comes before detailed design in our, um, in our design process here in that it's really easy to determine exactly what variety you want to grow and how far apart it should be planted. But what we're trying to focus on is having more importantly that these pieces are taking place within the whole um, uh, and in better relationship to all the other pieces of our farm. So, for instance, if we realize that we need a hedgerow or a windbreak on a farm, maybe before we even get into what species we might be using in a hedgerow or a windbreak is exactly how it's placed and how it relates to some of our vegetable production or grazing paddocks or vineyards or whatever other aspects we may have. So, um, this is great. Thanks, everyone, for for chiming in with your, um, this is great. So, 
one. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> okay. So, and then last of all, of course, you know, it's not just, um, you know, the designing, but uh, one of the most important pieces is, is actually doing this, right? P putting it in the ground and then, of course, continuing to accept feedback and recognizing that, that these systems are much more akin to sailing ships and that we're constantly adjusting the sails and our rigging. We're always accepting feedback and responding to change. We're responding to market. We're responding to what's working. We're responding to what we're enjoying. Um, and it's, it's a very dynamic process. And unfortunately, we're, we're never done. Um, OK. So um, goals articulation in and of itself is something that, honestly, we could do a full hour's webinar on because it is so critical. And, and I won't um, spend a whole hour talking about goals articulation, but um, I will encourage any of you who are planning to bring a design process to your farm to do some very, very thorough goals articulating, um, which is a little bit different than goal setting, right? It's, it's about figuring out really what it is that you're, um, that's really re making your heart resonate, right? It's not about kind of setting external objectives. And um, on my website, prospectrock.org, there is some educational resources and in there is a document that gives you some detailed exercises to help you um, articulate goals. And honestly, even if you aren't yet farming or even don't have a piece of land where you're farming, you may be even in the best position to do some goals articulation. And as I work with clients, you know, honestly, a lot of times, the place I prefer to work, the place at least I have the highest leverage is, is if folks have um, some ideas but they don't necessarily have a space yet. Um, meaning to say, you know, that you can do a lot with any given piece of land, but if you know that you want to do vegetable production or if you know you want to do an apple orchard, if you know you want to be grazing animals, having those goals really clearly articulated beforehand is really going to determine the criteria that you use to choose where you farm. And um, I, can't, I can't understate that. It's, it's so important that, um, that we, you know, actually build these practices. Um, if possible, you know, I, I recommend folks start market farming before they buy land, before they, you know, bite off a big chunk of debt. Um, Really, one of the biggest pieces, of course, for market growing is is being strategic about where you are relative to markets and thinking about what you want to grow and who's going to buy it, and are you in a position where a farm stand makes a lot of sense or where there's a tourism industry and there's a lot of restaurants serving really good food. So um, doing that goals articulation as soon in the process as possible and continuing to do it um, is critical. Um, holistic management also offers a really great toolkit for us in, in doing some goals articulation. And um, after the session, you may want to check in with Jesse. I'm not sure if they're still doing a whole farm planning course. But um, for those of you who are in Vermont, there has been, and I believe will be again, a, uh, a whole farm planning course, which really helps farmers through um, some of the business planning processes and you know making sure that those business plans really resonate with our ourselves and our lives. Um, here we go. Thanks, Jesse, for the link. Um, one, one piece of the goals articulation process in holistic management that I want to share here is just this idea of uh, a house and thinking of our goals really as, as a house, the foundation being our core values and our ethics, those things that we refuse to compromise on. And really being doing a, a lot of introspection and thinking about um, you know, why it is that you want to farm and making sure that your daily activities and all of the work that you do in terms of chores and, and, and your work is kind of based on those ethics and values rather than compromising them. And then one of the pieces that I think is, is really unique um, is, of course, the legacy and thinking about, in a permaculture perspective, 
intergenerational decision making, like how we are leaving our farms and landscapes for future generations of people, whether they're our own ancestors or not. Um, in the in the holistic management process, one way of doing this is actually writing your obituary, which may seem morbid to folks, but um, it's actually can be very fun. And to do this, I find just really offers such incredible insight on um, you know writing down what we want to have said after about us after we're gone, and and then having that as a as a written document to refer to in our decision making process and um, be able to make decisions based on that idea of legacy. Like is is are these decisions going to support that um, that legacy that we're trying to create? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. In, in that vein of long-term planning or or intergenerational thinking, um, there's a couple other things that I think you know are, are a part of where permaculture design came about in response to that are really critical for us as our growers and farmers to be considering in our farming plans. Um, most of you have probably heard about peak oil and are somewhat familiar with it. I'm not going to go too in depth with it, but of course, the reality at present is that we're at a point in history where we probably have the most resources available to human beings at any time before or after. And for the whole arc of history, of course, you know, we've, we've had more resources available than previous generations have, but we're extremely novelly in the new situation of recognizing that we have more resources available to us than previous generations had, uh, excuse me, than future generations will. So um, that's definitely something to take into consideration when we're thinking about our farm plans. Um, not only on the annual basis, but on the five or ten year basis, and really recognizing that this provides an opportunity at present for us to in invest energetic resources, to invest fossil fuels, to build some of the infrastructure that we may need that may be more difficult to build in the future. So, um, and this is really kind of where um, my business is positioned to a degree in that we work with folks to establish greenhouses and food processing facilities and root cellars, which quite frankly are energetically intensive and um, can be expensive. But when we look at the return on those investments over years, um, they're not going to get any cheaper to build and they'll start paying back the minute you build them. So um, we'll look at some other examples of how we might invest fossil fuels into our systems. but. Um, Here's just uh, another graph of the same kind of information that also includes consumer debt load, which I think is a really important piece because um, when we're thinking long term, we also want to recognize that a lot of our farms at present are very dependent on global economic systems that are frankly outside of our control and the, the challenge that we face as we move into the 21st century is how we make our farms and our communities um, locally viable. And really, uh, food, food producers and land managers are at the centerpiece of this potential for, um, for resilient eco economies, for economies that are not dependent on the whims of the stock market or foreign exchange um, currency rates. So, um, that just sets some context as well. And then, of course, dealing with the reality of climate change, here we have a graph of our 1990 USDA hardiness map. And, you know, again, anybody who's, who wants to just play with some of the interactive technology here, feel free to just, you know, throw your little dot on the map and we'll look at how this changes from 1990 to 2006. Um, sorry, I just wiped away everyone's dots, but um, I'll go back and do it again. We're seeing a pretty clear trend of moving hardiness zones. And in some areas of the country, that 
can mean actually cooler. Um, here in Vermont, there's very, very clear evidence that we're seeing um, warmer weather and especially warmer winters um, as far as the, act the objective records go. Um, that has major implications for our food systems. You know, when we look to the forecasts of climate, we see, you know, this is New Hampshire, but um, with aggressive reduced emissions scenarios where, you know, we implement carbon sequestration and, and reduce emissions, we're still looking at New Hampshire behaving as the Virginias by the end of the century, although more likely we're looking at New Hampshire behaving as the Carolinas. Um, so these are all factors that, that we want to take into play as we think about what techniques we use, what crops we use, what strategies we employ. And, you know, I'm not trying to be the, uh, the harbinger of doom here, but the more closely we pay attention to climate scientists, really the scarier this stuff gets, right? Um, we're seeing here this kind of arc of temperature and um, just notice how close we are to temperatures that human beings have not lived on the planet in. And then, of course, the forecast for our present emissions, um, climate, climactic response to our present emissions. So I, I'm not trying to scare anyone here, um, but I am trying to maybe do some goals articulation for all of us collectively in terms of the importance of making our farms carbon negative, of making our farms climate resilient, because unfortunately, with all of the forecasts and models out there, honestly, um, no predictions are going to be that accurate. Everything's unfolding more rapidly than was imagined. And the only things that we can really be certain of are increased incidents of severe weather. We're going to see late frost, we're going to see early frost, we're going to see drought, we're going to see, you know, torrential downpour. Here in Vermont, most of you are aware that we've seen um, successions of record-breaking floods just in the past few years. And that's, of course, a major factor for me. For those of you who are just looking at the um, aerial photography on my farm, you may have noticed that we're right in the river valley. Um, also, now is that chance to invest fossil fuels to set up systems that don't need them as constant daily inputs in the future. And um, whether that's investing in alternative energy systems or um, irrigation systems that um, and, and, and fertility cycling systems so that we, we are not stuck with um, our systems being completely dependent on things that are outside of our control. If, if your agricultural model involves, for instance, buying in a lot of grain, um, you know, that's fine to, to, to make sure that you're, you're meeting your, your bills, but you may want to be making a five or 10 year plan to start producing more of your own feed or build relationships with other local producers that may help you in that because um, obviously not only the trucking, but um, having grain come from very far away just puts it in an increasingly fragile situation. Um, okay. And, and then, you know, not least important is really thinking about how our economies are vibrant in local systems and really starting to weave these connections among local producers um, because honestly, global, ecos global economies um, are, are outside of our control. The forecasts uh, don't look good, but that said, I'm, I'm not trying to look into a crystal ball here, um, but what I am saying is that we see healthy economies happening all over and we can make an intention to be a part of them more directly and to create these relationships among local producers and our local communities that really bring real economic health. Economic health is based on appropriate stewardship of, of, of resources and regeneration of resources as, as good farms are capable of doing. Um, okay, and as you know, we're seeing things like the Food Safety Modernization Act and all these other, um, you know, uh, staples, commodities, debt speculation, all these things that are somewhat outside of our control 
are um, we're, ba we're ba we are able to insulate ourselves to them as we build real relationships with real people on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, you know, it's very concerning. I'm sure many of you who are growers are paying a lot of close attention, especially smaller growers are paying a lot of attention to the Food Safety Modernization Act. And all of these certification processes, even organic, become less relevant when we know our customers, our customers know who we are, um, and we're directly engaged. Um, so when, when, when people know who they can trust, they, they all become necessary, of course, and that's the reason we're seeing the demand for these types of laws is because when food production is totally out of sight with zero relationship, um, there's a lot of risk um, in terms of health. So let's take an opportunity now to build these relationships preemptively so that we're well positioned despite the frankly, potentially, you know, corporate controlled regulation that, that's unveiled. Um, okay, so getting back to our kind of landscape design process, um, we'll I'll just go back to our um, design process as a whole for a, a brief second if I can find the right slide. Yeah, sorry, I, I drew all over it, but um, so we're doing some goals articulation, um, and we, let's presume we've done some base mapping. For, for most of you, you know, unfurling a big piece of paper and drawing a map of your farm by hand is going to suffice. Honestly, to do this at detail with scale for the big ideas is less important. Certainly as you get into some of the more detailed aspects like how many of a certain plant or how wide certain rows are, you're going to need to work at scale. But for the big picture ideas, rough and out of scale is is better than doing it to scale because I find, you know, if we try to make these maps too carefully, we don't have as much fun just kind of throwing our ideas out on paper. But really the centerpiece of the process is um, better understanding our landscapes and that site analysis and assessment. and um, we can do that through what's called the scale of permanence. And the scale of permanence is something that actually is, is, predates permaculture, but um, it's a really great tool that we have to understand our leverage, essentially. So starting from climate, which is sure globally and societally wide, we're impacting climate, but on our own individual farms, there's not much that are decisions affect how much rain we get in a year, how cold it gets during the winter, um, you know, where we are relative to the equator or poles, and we're primarily responding to that. That's not something we're designing for. Whereas as we get down to the other end of the spectrum, things like how our farm feels to people when they walk on or what it looks like is entirely under our control. And so this spectrum is basically from the most permanent aspects of our landscape um, down to the least permanent, or I should say the ones that are most easily influenced by design. So that doesn't mean, this, so we're designing in response to these aspects and then increasingly we're able to design these um, along our own goals. So starting with climate, um, <clears throat> Obviously, things like average precipitation um, and rainfall are great, but we want to look not just to averages, but also to extremes. And especially recently, you know, averages are great baseline information to pay attention to, but we also want to know what is the most rain that we've ever had, what is the longest drought that we've ever had, um, what is the hottest that it's ever gotten? What is the coldest that it's ever gotten? And make our farms as resilient as possible, not just to averages, but also to extremes. Um, and then, of course, as, as I think I've already um, made clear, we really need to pay attention to how climate's changing and anticipate that and as a part of our climate analysis. So here we see a more detailed um, hardiness zone map. This is an updated one for Vermont. And we also see the Vermont state climate trends um, looking over the past 50 years 
um, which is showing um, pretty clear warming trend just based on the numbers as well as um, much more extreme warming during winter months, um, which might have some advantages for us as growers, frankly, but also has some disadvantages. And as I mentioned earlier, the reality of these forecasts is that the, the, the climate change is kind of a, um, it's, it's almost a misleading phrase because it, it seems to indicate kind of gradual, unifying, uniform, benign, predictable, whereas I think this phenomenon is better understood as, as climate chaos or climate collapse. And I, I don't mean to say that things are hopeless, but I mean to say we really want to buffer ourselves from floods. We want to buffer ourselves from winds. We want to have as much diversity as possible in our crops and, and techniques so that something's always winning um, regardless of what's happening. You know, I'm here um, in northern Vermont in what's classically considered a zone three, and we had bumper crops, crops of peaches. Um, and as far as I know, they were the first peaches ever grown in the Lamoille Valley of Vermont. And we just happened to have the right conditions during pollination that um, we had great fruit set. And I'm not banking on having a peach crop every year, but it's pretty exciting. And um, I think, you know, we, we all have a little room to do some experimentation in regards to um, our variables. Okay, um, all right, so landform then is kind of our next most permanent after climate, and let's see if I can get my little drawing thing here. Yes, perfect, so great. Um, so obviously, you know, things like a basic, sorry folks, um, things like a basic topo map of course, can be really, really helpful information here. But really, um, it might be that you just sit down and kind of draw everything that has anything to do with the landform of your farm, steep ledges, where you see boulders or bedrock expressed, um, what's flat, what's steep, and kind of we're, we're making these maps on, I make them on tracing paper so that I can, um, I can overlay them one after another um, this particular topo map is from Libramaps.org. Um, it's the USGS topography, but it's um, huge contour intervals and honestly doesn't tell us very much about our farms. If you've ever had a survey done or if there's any surveys on record with um, uh, having done a septic system or anything like that, these are going to be way more detailed. And in some cases, it's totally worth paying a surveyor or working with your, you know, your USDA and or CS who might be able to support these things depending on what practices you're trying to do. So we recently actually, I'm sorry I wasn't able to upload it into the slideshow, but we recently had an actual, you know, micro topography made of our farm. Um, and just kind of looking at these patterns of erosion and deposition and how that influences the big big overlays of the way our farms work. Um, water, of course, is, an, is another one. Um, and in the case of my particular farm, what we're looking at overlaid here is essentially the floodplain. And you can kind of see in the layout of crops, um, as, as if you can see in the layout of crops, we're kind of on these islands in the floodplain which is which is fortunately positioned that way because we've had opportunity to observe multiple hundred year floods and in the past few years we've seen two or three 500 year floods um, and one of the main efforts of our farm is to be reforesting um, buffers so that our more sensitive production some of the more valuable crops are um, protected. So when we put water and landform together, we end up with a wide variety of techniques, but um, what we're looking at here is an image of what's called key line design. Specifically, we're looking at Mark Shepard's farm in Wisconsin, um, whose 
this was farm, this was a uh, cornfield, this was bare black dirt when he started. And um, the entire layout is arranged over very nuanced expressions of topography. And key line design is, is again, another topic that's kind of a, a whole webinar in and of itself. Um, but long story short, what we're looking at is managing water as it moves off our landscape. So instead of our kind of conventional management, which is shunting, shunting water to a drainage ditch where it flows off the farm as quickly as possible, we're spreading it out along, so basically you know, the, the flow of the hills in this direction, and as rainwater rolls over the farm, instead of gaining speed and momentum and carrying soil off, it is spread across the farm, and these ditches are actually not, they're not really ditches, but they're um, these, um, they are like kind of plow lines that are not actually on contour, they are slightly off contour so that water is being better distributed towards the dry ridges and, and, and making it more even. Um, also, of course, tremendously preventing erosion. Also, of course, instead of having all that water fly off of our farms when we get tons of rain and then it's dry, it's storing that water in our systems and basically working like a battery so that we're between heavy rain and periods of dry, we're way balanced uh, in the middle. So here's, here's Mark Shepard here. Um, and in these rows of trees, he's growing oaks, uh, sweet acorn oaks, he's growing chestnuts, he's growing hazelnuts, he's grazing animals, he's um, on rotation doing annual vegetables. Um, it, it's a really great example of kind of farm scale permaculture design. So here's just a little bit more of what key line can look like. This is in Australia where, um, you know, water scarcity is a major issue, especially in pasture land. And this is key line where the key line management is specifically diverting water into these ponds, which are then able to be released as passive irrigation. So no pumps, just entirely gravity by holding water as high as it's possible in the landscape. Um, for, for many of us, um, this may not necessarily mean ponds, but it could mean something like a water tank. Um, in fact, we just recently were siting a livestock shelter at a farm for some friends and decided to put the livestock shelter on the highest possible part of the landscape. We put it basically on the top of the hill. And we did that because we put a huge roof on the livestock shelter, which A, made for a nice shady space for the animals in the summer. It's open walled with the open wall facing south so that it creates this warm microclimate for the animals during the winter months. And that whole roof area is used to fill a giant, it's a 2,000 gallon water tank, um, which fills almost instantly. I think most of us aren't aware of how much rain really comes in an event, you're, you're going to get um, 0.6 gallons, approximately 0.6 gallons per inch of rain per square foot of roof area. So you do the math on that 100 square feet, which is an incredibly small building, you're going to get about 60 gallons of water just of 100 square feet. So you put a thousand or a few thousand gallon water tank there. And in the case of this instance, we had all the water needs for the livestock there from the rainwater catchment without having to run plumbing up there. And then we had, because it was at the top of the hill, the ability to run a hose out of it to any other parts of the garden or pasture completely passively without any pumps. So um, here's another example of key line design. And then another aspect of key line is the key line plow and this is how these ditches can be made to manage the water as I said and they're also used of course to deepen topsoil and bring the organic and biologic components of soil a little bit deeper which is being used which, with incredible success by an organization known as carbon farmers and carbon farmers are essentially quantifying to what degree they're sequestering atmospheric carbon in their soil simply by deepening their topsoil. 
And of course, it makes plants more productive. Um, it makes pastures healthier, um, and is is it holds incredible promise for um, for sequestration of atmospheric carbon. Okay, so vegetation and wildlife is another, we're, we're not necessarily going through every layer of the scale of permanence, but um, I encourage you to, um, you know, if, if you come back and view this slideshow, you know, you can, you can go to slides like this and also I'll direct you towards some resources where these things can be found online. But essentially every single one of these needs to be thought about very, very carefully and then put together. And it's a lot of fun to do. Um, it, it does take time, but it's time that's infinitely worthwhile. And as we overlay these different things as different maps, we find that no matter how intimately familiar we are with our farms and landscapes, you'll come to new discoveries. You're going to learn. Um, and one of the reasons I like to do it with tracing paper is, of course, as I overlay different layers on top of each other, for instance, microclimate on top of vegetation and wildlife, I may find why there's different ecological communities on different parts of the farm. Um, more obviously, I may come to understand why we're seeing some of these differences, um, especially water and access. You know, as we overlay those, we may learn the catchment area that's really coming through a culvert or something like that and better understand why we're seeing roads flow out. Um, and uh, have some different opportunities for management. Okay, so vegetation and wildlife is, is one of the bigger ones and one of the more complex ones. It's one, you know, you can spend a lot of time just, you know, identifying the vegetation on your farm. Um, you, you can um, look things up in field guides, which is really great. One um, process that I really like is using field guides of natural communities, which are a little bit different than the field guides that you might use for, say, identifying an individual tree or shrub or wildflower. Um, field guides to natural communities are field guides to the groups of plants and animals and how they interact, which is very, very helpful for us when we're doing um, broad scale farm design to understand exactly what ecological community that a farm once was or could be. In the case of my farm here, um, as we look at islands like this and we look at the, the, the semblance of vegetation that was left on this hay field, um, this uh, would key out as what's called the sugar maple ostrich fern floodplain forest. Um, so that's um, an incredibly valuable tool for us to use as a point of inspiration. Um, on the one hand, it shows me, okay, that, you know, we already have very valuable vegetation in the overstory and the understory, both sugar maples and fiddleheads or ostrich ferns. But um, more importantly, it allows me to do what we call ecological analogs. So as we determine which plants we are looking in as crops, um, we can look, for instance, to the butternut, which is Juglan cinera, one of the native nut trees to this community. However, the butternut is subject to a blight and they're diseased. So we're working at hybridizing the butternut with the Japanese walnut, the heart nut, to create something that's a little bit more valuable to us, a little bit more resilient. That said, we're still planting butternuts. We have a lot of hope for them. And as we go on with this hybridization, we're finding some of the ones most suitable to our specific place. Um, another kind of half-step analog, of course, is the black walnut. And as we're looking at climate change, um, we're also, of course, anticipating uh, warmer weather and experimenting even with the Carpathian walnut, which um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend spending a lot of money investing in if you're if you're in northern Vermont, but by all means potentially experimenting with it's a, it's a, the Carpathian walnut being uh, typically not hardy, but the one of the more valuable in terms of walnut production. It's you know the walnuts that you buy in the supermarket are almost entirely Juglans regia, the Carpathian walnut, um, and 
the shagbark hickory, Caryo ovata, and even Caria ilionensis, which is our pecan. And quote unquote, you can't grow pecans in Vermont, but um, my pecan trees haven't read the books. So they are doing fine, and we'll see you know, whether we're going to be getting uh, nuts ripening in our short season. Um, we're not banking on them, we're not planting them entirely. But um, I think I really just want to drive around in a nut shaker, which is one of the reasons why uh, I'm planting so many nut trees. But also, of course, because of where my farm is um, in terms of floods. So let's, let's actually go to the kind of overall concept of the farm a little bit, um, which is, you know, we're, st you know, we're still doing some annual production. We're still doing some tillage. But all of that tillage is contextualized in the establishment of what we're calling productive buffers. Now, any buffer is good, and there's some great um, programs out there to subsidize and support folks reforesting along the river's edge. But they're pretty strictly um, purely native plants that are not productive. And um, that's good, but when you look at the, 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 the finances, a lot of farmers, of course, are somewhat reluctant to enter these relationships because their crops may be much more valuable than their buffers. But when we're looking at high value lumber, when we're looking at nuts, fruits, medicinal herbs, vines, berries, um, it, it may take a few more years, but we're looking at things that are actually yielding more value in the long run than any crop that they'd be growing in the river's edge, but with, with, with permanent roots. So um, I'm very excited about the potential for reforesting agriculture, but by no means do I mean to say that, you know, all of our farms are totally reforested. Um, it's always going to take shape completely differently based on every different farm and every different farmer's goals. Um, for our farm, it is high value fruits, nuts, medicines, and, um, and vines and berries, especially concentrated in the areas that are prone to erosion. Um, we're working with the Anglers Association who recognize the, um, the ability to shade the stream and prevent nutrients from washing into the river. And most importantly for us, as floods come through our farm, having these buffers established prevents immediate physical damage from flotsam or woody debris or icebergs, um, which we see pretty regularly, and also makes for incredible habitat. So this was an earlier draft of our design, and um, we see here kind of uh, a more recent one, and this one was a map done specifically for our irrigation plan, but um, if you look in the upper portion, um, I'm not sure if that's too small to be read, but um, you can see kind of our layout and how, what I'm getting at when I'm stressing this idea of a design concept, which is to say that, of course, it's important to plan your rotations and to have things spaced at the right distance, but more importantly is thinking about the big picture of the parts of our farm and how they fit together as an organism as a whole. Um, so, and how are animals able to integrate with some of our other production systems? For instance, here we see one of our production rows of hazelnuts. Um, in the fall, as the hazelnuts are ripening, we fence our chickens in, which completely weed the plants, fertilize the plants, and prevent squirrel predation, as well as um, being kind of isolated in the areas of high activity, um, which really limits how much squirrels are willing to risk getting across the farm. Um, which kind of leads me to introduce another one of our um, design principles, which is zones of use, um, which is essentially a tool looking at like our daily patterns of activity on a farm. Um, starting out, you know, in your bedroom when you wake up and thinking about how our chores unfold based on our normal daily activity. And if you find yourself, you know, needing to cross the entire farm to get to the dairy barn or the greenhouse or some of these high um, maintenance tasks, 
you're spending a lot of time and energy that's not that productive. And maybe you're not able to move your barn or greenhouse, but you can make the path from your door to there um, where your main garden rows are so that as you're walking through them, you're able to at least keep an eye on things, if not even pull some weeds or do some harvesting. And really, as much as possible, lay our farms out along the, um, the, the putting things which need the most attention in the places where they're going to get it. Um, one of the reasons, undoubtedly, that we had such success with our peaches is I put my peach in a place where I walk by it every single day. And I have a few trees, and <clears throat> the ones that I don't see, they don't get watered when it's dry. They don't get thinned. The, whereas the one that I was walking by day in and day out, if a bug was biting a peach, I noticed it, I picked that one off. Um, if there was a vole starting to eat the bark, um, which did happen to one of the ones kind of out of the way, um, I was able to respond to that immediately. So put things that need care and attention in the places where they're naturally going to get it as much as possible. Um, I, I, I think um, we can kind of start to summarize, and I might like to um, uh, provide an opportunity for any other comments or questions before we end. But most importantly, I just want to encourage you to make maps, have a lot of fun, kind of draw out your dreams, and really think things through. You know, design can be intimidating, but it's also an incredible amount of fun. And, you know, it's, it's iterative. We're always learning and we're always making mistakes. But when we can make those mistakes on paper, um, it saves us a lot of time, energy, and resources. Um, and get out in the landscape and, you know, use some stakes and flagging. And if you're thinking about, you know, where you might site your barn or greenhouse or one of your next rows, maybe flag it or stake it first and walk by it for a few weeks and really feel it out. I'm planning on building a barn at my farm right now, and I staked the four corners and had it there to the point that, I saw the barn and people would be, you know, walking across this open area of grass and I was like, oh, you're standing in my barn. And what happened, one day I pulled in with a trailer behind my truck and I couldn't make the turn without clipping the corner of the barn. However, fortunately, the corner of the barn was simply a wooden stake that hadn't been constructed yet. And I was able to kind of accept that feedback and learn that the, the position of the barn needed to move if I wanted to continue to access that one route with truck and trailer. Um, so as we, we close on these images here, I just want to share the Akogi Farm, which is in Putney, Vermont. Um, really absolutely inspiring pioneers in growing rice um, in Vermont. And the uh, Mr. Akogi's, you know, a Japanese-born American who reads Japanese and has been reading all the research that has happened in the past few years to bring uh, rice to the northern islands of, of Japan. And these are areas of their farm that would have otherwise been considered unproductive, kind of spongy fields. This is, you know, what they look like in the early season, turned into some of the most beautiful, productive, and profitable areas of their farm. So the more we can kind of think through how problems might be made into solutions and how all these pieces integrate and reciprocate to, to feed off of each other, um, the, the more resilient our farms become. So anyway, um, we're nearly closing. I, if there are any last comments or questions, feel free to um, throw them in the box there. I'm sorry we only had an hour. Obviously, it's kind of a teaser. There's a lot of information um, to try to fit, but I hope you found it worthwhile. And um, Stay tuned to the UVM extension webinars. Next week is going to be uh, uh, one on shiitake mushrooms, which I'm excited about. And um, here Jesse shares our, our link for feedback. So, um, yeah. Great, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining.
Hey everyone, um, thanks for joining us and thank you so much Keith for being with us. Um, and and uh, we really appreciate all the information you shared. Um, Tina Barney had a question. Hi, Tina. Uh, she said, do current use reviewers recognize permaculture principles as valid and supported? And for those of you outside of Vermont, current use is a uh, regulation that uh, values property at an agriculture um, for agriculture use and has tax implications. Keith, do you have any experience with that? Um, yeah, thanks. So current use definitely values having uh, design on paper. Um, uh, so they, you know, they definitely, it, it, it depends, which is really kind of the answer to all regulatory questions, right? But um, if you have a working plan, um, you definitely need to be producing something, whether it's, you know, whether it's pasture, hay, apples, berries, um, even timber. But um, the better recorded you have that and, and the better documented you have any planning or planting or implementation, um, the easier it's going to be to, to get current use. Great. Um, and uh, Mike Gibson asks um, about young nut trees and looking for a good place to purchase them. Um, and also, do you grow yours from cuttings or do you purchase your trees? Yeah, great. So we have a nursery, Mike, that's become one of the biggest growing parts of our farm is selling young trees, um, particularly the hazels where um, we're now at the point of nut production with our hazelnuts that we're, you know, we're planting our seed out um, from our own trees that we've collected. In terms of some of the walnuts and chestnuts um, and, and pine nuts and other nuts like that, we both collect seed. We do buy in some nuts, um, but um, my website is prospectrock.org, which um, you might want to check out. We're going to be doing some of our nursery sales, and depending on where you are, you know, feel free to send me an email because if you're, if you're not in Vermont, I may know of some other um, reputable nut nurseries. Um, there's, it's, um, it's a really exciting crop for, for, for me and for us. Um, it does take a little bit of time to get established, but, but we've started, you know, really carefully running the numbers and the return on investment after a few years is, is, um, is better than, than most things. Great, Keith. Thanks. And I know that some work has been done on uh, permaculture and looking, doing financial um, projections for permaculture-based farms. Um, can you let people know about that that resource? Um, uh, because I, I know that for farmers, a lot of them want to be able to uh, look at financial projections and better understand how these things are going to contribute to their bottom line. Yeah, it's pretty nascent, but um, there is, you know, some growing documentation, and it's at this point somewhat crop-based. There's some records that I'm aware. Of. There's there's a, a real body of records growing with um, with Saskatoon in Canada, and you know, so all your almond launcher, your June berries, and your you know shad bush or whatever you want to call them, um, elderberry. Um, there is. I'm sorry that I don't have it off the top of my head that there is a database um, which again maybe if, if you want to just try to send me an email I could see if I could um, share the link for what is uh, what they've basically got some like accounting spreadsheets for a couple of different enterprises. Great. Well, thank you very much. I see that some people might be having a trouble with our SurveyMonkey link uh, requiring a sign-in. Um, I'll have to double check on that. It shouldn't. Um, so try the link again when you get a chance. Um, but I'm going to wrap up now and say thanks to everybody for joining us. Keith, thank you so much for taking the time to put this together. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone on future webinars. Uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks, everyone.